Oh, sounds promising. <laughs> and the Lord said, will someone change his mic? <laughs> Happy New Year to everyone I haven't spoken to already. Uh, I'd like to put it down to the antibiotics and... Um, and Jakeman's, um, but actually I did have the miracle cure. I, I don't know if you're fond of um, uh, Westerns at all. I do, love, I do love Clint Eastwood. I think he's marvellous. My favourite film is The Outlaw Josie Wales. Have you ever that And um, he has a terrible habit of chewing tobacco and spitting. Do you remember? And um, there's this one man he meets who's selling the miracle cure. And he says, oh, I've got just the thing for you. He said, it cures this, cures that. And he spits on his white coat and he says, as it do on stains. <laughs> well, I needed a miracle cure, and I found it, and it found it from within Bethel. It was Professor Jason's homemade stout. <laughs> no, absolutely marvellous stuff. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, some get filled with the spirit, but some get filled with Jason's plonk. But and it was, it was, it was. Uh, it's good to be here. And you know, reading that passage this morning accompanied by what I call the Bethel buzz, you know, um, really was very fitting, wasn't it, as we enter into worship this morning, as we gather in this place at the beginning of a new year, set on giving God his proper place. And I think that's a very important direction for us to go as we start the new year together. The last six months has been a bit of a whirlwind, really, hasn't it, with all the things that are coming. Christmas, have you caught up on your sleep yet, Marianne? Um, <coughs> yeah, Christmas was a whirlwind as well. Now we've got all that stuff behind us for another year, we can now start focusing on the direction that God really wants us to go. And I, I honestly believe that begins with the relationship that we have with God, how we understand him, the right choices that we make. And so after some prayer and um, some interesting uh, texts that I got saying that this scripture was a scripture given to the church a, a number of years ago, um, I feel that we should spend four or five weeks looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Now you might be wondering how on earth can we spend five weeks there? Well they spent three weeks constantly in worship. Um, it must have been an absolutely amazing time. But you know, it's important that we make right choices in everything we do. I, I was reminded this week, I was talking to Eddie, and I was reminded this week of a, a story um, I heard of a, a company who were looking to fulfill a position working in customer relations. And they needed someone who was really sensitive to everything, you know, and who could respond appropriately. And so they managed to hire a, a, a specialist interviewer. And this chap, but rather unfortunately, had one ear at the top of his head there, and one ear was down there. So the three candidates, an Englishman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman, of course, and the, English, the Englishman came in and um, sat down, he asked a number of questions, he said, now, um, this is quite a sensitive position that we want to interview you for. So, um, could you tell me, is there anything you notice that's different about me? He said, well, actually, you know, chap, I didn't want to embarrass you, but I did notice that you've got one ear higher than the other. And he said, that's right. Well, thank you very much. And he signed him on. That's very good. So, the uh, Scotsman comes in, and he was going through the questions, and, and he said, um, excuse me, um, can I just ask you one question? Did you notice there's anything different about me? And he went, I know you mention it. And he goes, he said, well, he says, yeah, one lug up and one lug down. He goes, 
Right, OK, thanks very much. Then the Irishman came in and he went through all the questions and he came in and he says, he said, now, could you tell me, do you notice anything different about me? He says, well, it's funny you should say that, he says. I notice you wear contact lenses. <laughs> he said, that's amazing. He said, how did you work that? He says, well, with ears like that, you're not going to get a pair of spectacles, are you? <laughs> <laughs> We all make choices, don't we? We all make decisions depending on the facts that are placed before us. And in context of, of this passage this morning, many people have asked one question. Why did God choose Israel? Why do you think God chose Israel above all other groups of people that he could have chosen? Well, the answer is, why not? The fact is, God chose these folk because they will provide a picture of humanity in microcosm so that we could all relate to them in their ups and in their downs. And as we read through the scriptures with some hindsight, particularly the Old Testament, we can see the model that the people of Israel are intended to be through good times, through bad times, through ups and through downs. They just exemplify humanity. And then God demonstrates his mercy and his grace in such a clear way so that there can be no mistake to us that what God sees in his people is value and potential. And that should be an incredible encouragement to us this morning, particularly after the holiday period when we're all down and we're all waiting for the credit card bill to come in if it's not here already. On our journey through the scriptures, we see the establishing of a kingdom. We see the losing of a kingdom. And it strikes me that God's people, both ancient and modern, have a real problem. And that is that we only see the good things for what they are after the event. And then we spend this extortionate amount of time trying to recapture what we've lost. Instead of looking at what God has given us and seeing the blessings that are there and the subsequent blessing that is available to us for the future. And I suppose this is what this passage is about. It's about people understanding that God has worked in the past, he is working in the present, and we've got to be those people in the present in order to create the future that God has planned for us all. Now the story of King Solomon and his time in history is considered by many people to be the very heyday of Israel. It was the golden time. Everyone wanted to go back. Even in the time of Jesus, he wanted to go back, thinking that he was going to be the Messiah, a warrior king, though, who was going to bring those days of David and Solomon back. But the problem was, Solomon, for all his splendour and for all his wisdom, lacked in his personal disciplines, and he ignored the signs of decay that was going on in the country. And so he compromised himself. I mean... 365 wives? Is that wise? 365 mother-in-laws? Is that wise? And of course another difficulty that he had was he wasn't a military man. And as a military man I can appreciate perfectly how David was. David maintained the country. Solomon neglected that and so the country fell into physical and spiritual disrepair. Now what I'd like you to do over the next few weeks is start looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 5 through chapter 8. Make that part of your, your meditation on, the daily, on a daily basis. Just look at this picture. Have a good look at 1 Kings and you can see the picture of the magnificent building that was being made. And I wish we had time this morning just to talk about the temple. And as important as that was, it's not quite so important in this moment for us. But to have entered this sanctuary must have been an amazing experience. It's a bit like the lost, um, the lost um, place they've got in Russia. You know that, um, have you, did you see it? They've, they've made a model of it. It's a, it's a meeting room of the Tsars, and it's lined with gold and everything, and they've made a replica of it. But it was even greater than that. Everything was overlaid in gold. And right at the very centre of the temple, right at the heart, was this Shekinah glory of God that which came down at the dedication of the temple. And in a beautiful prayer, as we heard read to us, 
Solomon gives thanks to God for his grace and he recognises the one great principle by which the kingdom must be maintained and that is the king's obedience to God. Now I'd like us to look again at a little bit at, um, verse, from verse 11 um, when Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord that the royal and the royal palace that had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own place, palace. The Lord appeared to him at night and said, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Now as for you, if you walk before me as David your father did and do all I command and observe all my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne. As I covenanted with David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a man to rule over Israel. But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and the commands I've given you, and you go off and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I've given to them, and will reject this temple, which I've consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. And though this temple is now so imposing, all who pass by will be appalled and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to these people? And then people will answer. Notice this, this isn't the people of God. People will know, will know. Because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshipping and serving them. That is why he brought all this disaster on them. Now I could launch at that point. Because this is non-Christians looking at Christians. We are under a microscope. But what God is saying first and foremost here, that he is passionate. And he wants us, his people, to be passionate about his grace. He wants us to understand that it is his grace that is the foundation of our being as disciples. And as such, that reveals the essence of God as we participate in the divine nature. And this is a relationship principle that we see in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. What does Peter say to Peter? Grace and peace to you many times over as you, have, you deepen in your experience with God and Jesus, our Master. Everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God. The best invitation we ever received. We were also given absolutely terrific promises to pass on to you. Your tickets to participation in the life of God after you turned your back on a world that is corrupted by lust. Now here we see again the relational aspect of faith that gives us a perspective that actually changes our being and causes us to ask the questions. Are we aware of this divine nature of God? Is our perspective of God, is it a relational one? Or are we kind of confused because God is always a way out there somewhere and not reachable? You see, the picture that we have is of the temple. It's an illustration of how things were to be in the future. But now, rather than having a building in which to dwell, God has chosen the hearts of folk, just like you and me, to live in. To live in by his spirit, to demonstrate that he cares so much that he's willing to take the risk of allowing us to represent him. That is an incredible responsibility that we have. How incredibly humbling when we consider the physical magnificence of that temple. Now try to transpose that. No amount of time in the gym or the beauty salon is going to cut it. But nonetheless, God chooses to live in us by his Spirit. 
Dear old Paul says to the Corinthians, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own, you were bought with a price, therefore honour God with your body. You know, I just remembered there, we used to have a, a warrant officer, an engineer, and um, he used to go out running all the time. And, uh, you know, we'd be pulling ourselves out of bed in the morning, and he'd be in his gym, kept running around. And uh, the CEO one morning shouted at him and said, are you all right, mister, whatever his name is? He said, uh, yes, sir, temple's a body, you know. And actually, it was quite a challenge to me because as he, for him, physical exercise was a thing. He probably didn't understand that it was a temple of the Holy Spirit. But nonetheless, as believers, we become people who live a life of liberty to be, to be who we can be and not a people of license to do what we want. We have a responsibility. And this whole identity issue is paramount in our understanding if we're ever going to function effectively as the people of God. Now, in relationship with God, he walks with us. But we have to make the effort to walk as well. You know, I remember we had a family come to visit us a number of years ago. And we always used to have 18, 19 people in for lunch on a Sunday. And so in the afternoon, we'd have lunch together, and then we'd go on an on a expedition, we called it for the kids. We used to go for a walk. And it would be anything from three to six miles, okay? And this particular family came to visit us, and they had two boys, and one was a particularly badly behaved youngster, a 12-year-old. I mean, he was climbing on the dinner table. That was the kind of kid he was, you know. And um, we went for the walk, and as we were getting ready for the walk, everyone was getting their shoes on and everything else, and he started showing off that he wanted a backpack. He had to have a backpack, and he, such was the commotion, I went and got a day sack out for him. And I put it on it. I said, there, now you've got a backpack. He said, I want something in it. I want to be like a soldier. I said, OK, so we, we've got a poncho and things, and I just chucked a couple of things in. We're 200 yards into what was only a three-mile walk, and he started whinging. And he went on and on. You know the kind of moments they are? So his mother went straight to his aid, and that was the problem. And I said, no, no. This is my walk, my rules. I said, he's got to carry it. Well, three miles later, a very distressed mother and a really miserable little boy, we got home and the lesson had been learned. And here's the lesson. We are responsible to carry our own kit. If we choose to carry stuff when we don't need it, then it's our problem. That's the responsibility of a relationship with God. And this is such an important lesson for us as Christians who take on so much often that is unnecessary. And even it's for the, a challenge for those who sit around and ex, for the ride and expect others to do all the service on their behalf. Listen to this little poem. One night I had a wondrous dream. One set of footprints there was seen the footprints of my precious Lord, but mine were not along the shore. But then some stranger prints appeared, and I asked the Lord, what have we here? These prints are, prints are large and round and neat, but Lord, they're far too big for feet. My child, he said in sombre tones, for miles I carried you alone. I challenged you to walk in faith, but you refused and made me wait. You disappeared, you would not grow. The walk of faith you would not know. So I got tired and fed up, and there I dropped you, and there you sat. Because in life, there comes a time when one must fight and one must climb, when one must rise and make a stand, or leave their bottom prints in the sand. <laughs> this is true identity. We have to take account of who we are and work out our responsibilities as believers. Because knowing who we are in Christ, it changes everything absolutely everything in our life. You know, in 2 Chronicles 7, we have a picture of Solomon leading his people in worship. And then we just catch a glimpse of the temple that they built, the incredible beauty, the no expense spared attitude of worship as a nation as they gather at the dedication to observe the worship of God. And then, after all that sacrifice, 120,000 sheep, you can't imagine it, can you? I've never seen that many sheep. 
And then the glory of the Lord, you've seen the fire come down to consume the sacrifice, and then the glory of the Lord above the temple. What did they do? They knelt with their faces to the ground. Look at verse 3. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. I don't know what pictures are conjured up in your mind. All I can think about, and it's such a small scale, I know, but you've been to York, haven't you? And you see the minster rising up. And I, I just imagine when I first read that, everyone walking around York and suddenly seeing the glory of God above York Minster and everyone falling on the pavement. I'm sure it was bigger than that. But it was amazing just to try and give it some scale. And this participation in worship and relationship with God, it was absolute for them. It brought an identity, it brought dignity, it brought promise, it brought reality to their lives that they'd never known before. They saw a physical manifestation of God. This was reserved for people like the prophets, but now they could see it. Ordinary folk saw the presence of God. And there's such great significance to this event, just as fire is falling to consume the sacrifice, this is a sign of acceptance. Then the arrival of God to fill the temple, to put his seal of approval on that place. This was a time of worship that they wouldn't ever forget. It would go on for generations. It would be a story that they told and spoke of with awe. Well, let's see your first heading. I know we've done the long introduction today, but options to take. Later on, the Lord appeared to Solomon at night. And this further appearance was an indication to him that his work had been accepted, that his, his actions as a leader were right, and he was told that God's blessing will be with him and his dynasty. But that is conditional on right choices. If we look at verses 11 through, right through, which we just read, some choices on the surface seem easy to make. Others are not so easy to make. Now, a fine example of that was seen during the Second World War. Do you remember when Coventry was going to be bombed? They broke in the German code. Uh, Churchill was told, um, and he had two options. He could evacuate the, the citizens of Coventry and save hundreds of lives, which would indicate to the Germans that the code had been broken, or he could let it be bombed and actually use that to save millions of lives. And he had to make that decision. I wouldn't want to make that kind of decision. You see, the word if, when placed at the beginning of a sentence, has control over everything that follows it. If is a word which carries tremendous power and should attract far more attention than it actually does. And like the useful word that it is, folk often use it to control circumstances while giving an impression that they're committed to a cause. Because, you see, most people really wish to, service, to serve God, but only in a, an advisory capacity. The reason we don't spend much time, you know, meditating on that word if, is that we're so preoccupied with the word that follows it. Then. If you do a certain thing, then there's going to be a certain consequence to follow. And this is just natural cause and effect reality, which we see in every area of our life every day. But to the Hebrew mindset, of course, and we've spoken about it before, there's this three-dimensional thinking that goes on. So there's cause and effect and ultimate effect. Simply put, our actions have lifelong consequences. And that is true whether you're a Christian, a Buddhist, a Muslim, an atheist. It doesn't matter where you stand. That's just the way that life is. We make choices and there are consequences that follow. Because the things that we do and the things that we choose not to do have consequences. So if you put your hand in the fire, then you're going to be burned. You might well get maimed for life. If you go onto the motorway, on a busy motorway, on your vehicle... Um, and you close your eyes, I mean most motorists do that, as bikers I understand it, okay, then it might cause an accident and might have impact on future generations. If you get more sleep, then you're better able to meet the challenges of the next day, you have a clear mind, and you can work out the consequences of your action. If you save money, etc., it goes on and on and on. If it's raining outside and you go out and you get wet, 
you could get ill, you could die. Now this is just basic logic, isn't it? Every day, in so many different ways, you and I encounter if-then realities. And these are just examples of thousands of basic, fundamental cause and effect realities of life. And they're so simple, and they're so obvious, that we probably don't even consider them or give them a moment's thought. But as Christians, we have an enormous advantage in life in that some of the choices we make are empowered by God and therefore can be far more significant and fruitful, but they are still our choices. See, God cannot and will not make our choices for us. But he is faithful in spelling out all the options. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, then I will turn away, etc., etc., etc. You know, a lady called Dorothy Sayer said, the divine scheme of things, as Christianity understands it, is at once extremely elastic and extremely rigid. It is elastic in that it includes a large measure of liberty for the creature. It is rigid in that it includes the proviso that however created beings choose to behave, they must accept responsibility of their own actions and endure the consequences. Now many of the choices that we make are superficial and relatively insignificant to life. But many other choices that we make affect us at the core of our being. The choices put before us on a spiritual level are clear. If we choose to ignore the clear truth of the gospel, if we choose to reject the free gift of salvation that is offered in Jesus Christ, that is offered freely to us, then we will spend eternity separated from the reality of God's love and separated from his presence, and that is hell. If we choose to believe that God loves each one of us and has opened up a way through Christ so that we can be reunited with our Creator in a wonderful, life-changing, forever encounter, then, next slide, John, we will experience his power and we'll catch a glimpse of his majesty knowing deep in our hearts the victory and beauty of life that God intends for us to have. Then, listen to this bit, embedded in our being, there will be a certainty of heaven. That is hope. So we've had options to take. Secondly, understanding choice. You know, choices and consequences, they surround us everywhere. And this is true for the whole of humanity, but possibly it's more significant for Christians to grapple with because in our forgiveness we recognise the right choices that have to be made. We have a freedom of choice, but we're only free to make the right choice. Anything else is sin. John Deffenbacher says, freedom is the right to be wrong, not the right to do wrong. Wasn't it Paul who said to Roman, but thanks be to God, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Here's a little exercise for you. If you were to look up two words, free and freedom, just look them up in the New Testament. Now in the NIV, I think free appears 43 times, freedom 15 times. Not a massive, massive um, project. It becomes obvious once we remind us, if we look at the freedoms of choice, it becomes obvious that we bear responsibilities for the choices that we make. But comes the question, and I want to make a theological statement here, and I want you to listen very carefully. Surely... God is sovereign. And as Christians, we believe that he controls everything. Yeah? If that's true, then Christians worship a God who is able to do anything he wants in us, regardless of our choices. And because we're in the world and not of it, we're in submission to a higher power, which means we accept his will. Do you want me to read that again? Okay? Surely God is sovereign. And as Christians, we believe that he controls everything. Well, if that's true, 
then Christians worship a God who is able to do anything he wants in us regardless of our choices. And because we are in the world and not of it, we are in submission to a higher power, which means we accept his will. Do you realise that there are millions of people, sincere godly people all over the world, who would agree with that statement? There are folk who sincerely believe that if God wants to do something in our lives, he will just do it, regardless of our choices. That is a form of fatalism. This is a symptom of the reformed tradition that we built our churches upon. The sad fact is, it's not true. Now, before you burn me as a heretic, let me explain. God has given us the freedom to think and to make decisions. Our thoughts, to a greater or lesser extent, run our lives and determine how we live. So, if our thoughts are wrong, then our, long, our lives will be wrong as well. You see the point? God is sovereign, there is no doubt about that fact. But in his sovereignty, he uses you and me a bit like his arms and his legs. And this is the whole point of this teaching at the dedication of the temple. Right choices and right actions, then the glory of God will be seen through his people. God with his people, God in his people, God through his people. Do you remember the story of Gideon? When Gideon was charged to go, and God said to him, go in the strength that you have, and I will be with you, says God, as he clothes himself with Gideon. But Gideon had to choose to follow. If we choose not to follow, then God will find someone who will. So many people in the Christian church, you know, they've lost the ability or given away the ability to reason, to judge, to analyse truth, logic and common sense, and so will not engage in real-life issues. The result is that when we encounter teaching or practices, something that we don't really agree with or accept or understand, what we tend to do is escape, and we switch into what I call a little spiritual mode, where we float off with the fairies somewhere, and we start saying, well, God will reveal the truth to me, I just need to pray. That is just a naive response of spirituality that wants to know God but will not accept the responsibility of its humanity and which spiritualises events rather than face life, warts and all. There's no doubt at all that God works in incredible ways. I've experienced it in my own life and oftentimes when circumstances appear impossible, he makes things possible. But to base our life on escapism is not living in a manner that is either real or wise. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, that is action, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, that's action again, then will I hear from heaven will hear, and will forgive their sin and will hear the, heal their land. There is sweat in these verses. Action in faith. Sanctify common sense and prayer. And by all means, pray about everything. We're encouraged to do just that, but we are commanded to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service, spiritual act of worship. Be no longer, be, come on, conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. There is participation in the divine nature. Living as a Christian, you know, is not always as easy as ABC. That is why when many Christians suffer a drama in their lives, they suffer unnecessarily because they can't cope with it anymore because they never face up to real life. See, God doesn't tell, our, tell us to sell our brains for spare parts when we come into his kingdom. The vast majority of problems that we have in understanding God and his will and his purpose would disappear if we just would think and clearly about our faith and work through things logically and sensibly in the light of the, of the word that he's given us. So, I'm going to give you some homework. 
uh, for this week, just think over this question about the reality of faith, the reality of your relationship with Jesus Christ, the encounter that you have with God, do you really face life warts and all? Are you ready to accept that offer that he's given you of salvation in Jesus Christ? Or are you going to hedge around it all the time? But if you've made that decision to be a Christian, ask this question of yourself. Do those who know me understand that I'm a Christian? That my life has changed for the good? Or do they think I've just become strange and eccentric? Shall we pray? We thank you, Lord, for the brilliant picture of the temple, the dedication where you appeared and where people saw you, maybe for the first time. And so we pray that as we step out in faith this morning, as we come to worship you, you would reveal yourself to us in a very real way. That you'd help us to understand the reality of our bodies being temples of the Holy Spirit of our responsibility to engage with you on a personal level. And we do pray that you'd help us to begin to see our responsibility as your children, to live real lives that are positive and free. So encourage us from your word, we pray, in Jesus' lovely name. Amen. Thank you.